this is a truth that is a age old truth. We've repeated it many, many times at Ellerslie. And I always wonder when I'm preparing a message like this, it's like, now why, why am I going back to a th similar theme instead of moving into more novel territory? And yet this is just good old fashioned Christianity. And I think the spirit of God will return me to these territories on purpose for my sake and for yours, that we don't just move past going, oh, I know that truth, but we keep revisiting the core truths so that we grow properly. And this is, uh, this is a rich one. It is, it is a, a potent one, but it demands action on our part. And so let's, let's dive in. <clears throat> I'm not, I want to dive in. I, I know that... Uh, Either Mike, oh, there it is, okay, uh, a line in the sand. Uh, so the term a line in the sand or drawing a line in the sand means to put a stop or a limit to something. So when you're drawing a line in the sand, you're basically saying no more or not past this point. And so it's a significant maneuver of soul, but it can mean one of two things. And it usually means both simultaneously, but it could mean I cannot continue in this direction or this evil that is coming against me cannot go past this point. Or the flip side of the same coin is that I must stop this behavior so that I can start a new one. And so drawing a line in the sand might mean enough of that, now I need to do this. At the start of every year, it's interesting how supple and sensitive we are to the things that we need to change in our life. Now, I'm not sure why that fades during the year because it doesn't fade, fade. It just fades. It's just a subtle fade where at a certain time of year when we're starting something new, we recognize that we want old things to pass away and we want to press forward into new territory. And by the way, this isn't just a spiritual Christian thing. This is a human thing. It is something deeply baked inside of us to not settle for mediocrity, but to press forward. The world will call it bettering ourselves. And it is a phenomenon that exists inside of us. And yet, ironically, many of us struggle with knowing how to get out of park when it comes to these things. And that's why New Year's resolutions are a laughing matter for many people. In fact, they scoff at them and they scorn them. Why? Because they tried for 20, 30 years every year to better themselves and they ended up, you know, their gym membership just cost them money throughout the year and they didn't use it. Their new bike, you know, their exercise bike that they put into the, the living room, it never got used. Or maybe once it got used, okay? Remember that first time you got it out of the package and you tried to go, oh, this is gonna be great, I'm gonna get in shape. And then you never did. Okay, so we have these trinkets and these memorial stones all over our life of in attempts to better ourselves that didn't produce betterment. And those things can haunt us, especially right now, as we sense the spirit of God freshly moving inside of us to press us forward, but we look over and we see the exercise bike. And it reminds us, and the enemy will, you know, stick his head into the whole situation and say, yeah, as if this is gonna be any different it will be different. And that's precisely what this message is. This is drawing a line in the sand and says enough. However, the way we move forward is not in human endeavor. It's not in human ambition. It's not in human grit and determination. It's something different that we uniquely possess as Christians. I'm guessing my clicker is not working. So I think we might need to forward uh, and progress me uh, in the back here. So let me, oh, oh now, now it's working. Okay, well, great job, whatever you guys did back there. So the line, enough of that. So here's two options. I have a lot of quotes for you in this one that are just soul quotes. It's high time to stop that. You ever had something in your life that's just sort of there and you know it's a behavior that's like questionable and yet you justify, you justify, you justify, but it keeps sort of eroding your life. It's not a healthy behavior, but you have your rationalizations and your justifications and finally you come to that place where you say enough of that, right? Now that's one option and here's the other one. It's high time to start that. Uh, usually I almost always think of exercise when I think of that. However, 
whatever would be the equivalence in our lives, practically, where there is an activity that we are supposed to be doing. You know, the classic illustration in this church is sharing the gospel with those that don't know it. Okay, okay, enough of these excuses that I have for myself. It's high time I start that. Again, these are lines in the sand. The great weakness of sin. Now, this is a strange thing. It might seem a little out of the blue in our conversation, but it does have something to do with it. See, sin has a great weakness. I know that's funny to assess sin. Sin, of course, is a weakness in and of itself, right? But the function of sin is a very powerful thing, and it works really well. It's a very powerful, very effective tool that the enemy uses against us in our life. However, it has a weakness. And so that when the enemy sponsors it and he promotes it in our life, there's one thing the enemy wishes he could attach to it. He could install into its makeup, and that is breaks. But sin does not have breaks. So therefore, the enemy will push and push, and sin will gain momentum in our life, and it will start destroying and eroding. It will mess up our relationships. It will mess up our inner man. It will mess up our thought life. Everything about our life is beginning to come undone. And then if the enemy could just pause it right there, somehow put on the brakes and say, aha, gotcha. But he can't do that. Sin continues. And when it does, it awakens the human to say, I don't like this anymore. Sin was pleasurable for a season, but it's no longer pleasurable. And there's a vulnerability, in the most positive sense, inside the human to cry out for help and aid, which is a great time for a savior to step in. And so for all of us in here, technically, even if you're not in the extremity of what sin could be in your life, there is a vulnerability to flirting with sin in its smaller forms, its lowercase forms. I don't know if you guys have ever heard uh, this statement. I don't remember. Uh, we've tried to analyze where the root source was of this. I remember it started with John and Betty Stam, and they were missionaries. And so then I thought I heard someone source it back to Hudson Taylor. But it was seven steps upward and seven steps downward. So you're, you're moving one of two directions in your life at all times. You're either moving towards heaven or you're moving <clears throat> uh, towards hell. Eesh. And so most of us are probably in agreement. We don't want to move towards hell, right? We want to move towards heaven. And yet, at the very crux of the decision of if you're going down or up, level one of going upwards towards heaven is taking the danger of sin seriously. The first step downward is trifling with sin or taking it lightly. Isn't that interesting? It's like that will define which direction you are going. Now, many of us have encountered those uh, rotting elements in our life where we've catered them too long. And then we were awakened, ironically, in the same process because of the misery that comes with it to finally draw a line in the sand and say, this must stop. However, some of us actually tried to stop it in our own strength. We agreed that it was wrong, but then we tried to change it in our own human effort. And we realized it didn't work. Now, hopefully all of us in here have had the encounter with Jesus Christ to recognize the true solution, but I'll get to that. All right, what I'm walking through is what all humans deal with, not, not just what we as Christians deal with, even though we as Christians have a front row seat to this dynamic in our lives as well. Yearning, I love my grammar here, yearning to for something better. No, so don't read it that way. Yearning for something better. Sorry, guys. It's like that wall over here on the side that's unfinished. It's instinctive in our human design. So to yearn for something better is instinctive inside of us, which means it's actually part of the way God designed us in his image, that he desires us to grow, to mature, to not decompose, but to actually be composed into his likeness, to be transformed from glory to glory, to grow up. This is his model. And so it's a good thing. However, when you extract God from it and you just have the human variety of it, you have our world around us. That's exactly what they're doing. They, they have their self-help endeavors. They, you know, you do this and you could lose 10 pounds. They, we're always trying to sell a better version of you to you. 
And that's what the world does. That's what marketing is oftentimes based on. I don't want to criticize marketing and say it's all wrong. It's just that it oftentimes is catering to that dimension of who we are. This is for you, as opposed to how well is the marketing campaign going to work like, hey, this is for the glory of God. And everyone's like, I'm not buying that product. In other words, that's what motivates us, but it isn't what motivates the world. The two ways to fix our lives. So we have two options here. We have self-effort and we have God power. So I'm going to divide up the stage into twos, and you guys have seen me do this before. So I always put the first over here and the second one is over here, right? The first is self. It's symbolic in scripture of the flesh. It's my ability. It's me absent of God in the natural stuff that I have attempting to live a life that actually this is impossible to live. Then there's a second option. It's God, God power. It's me yielding to my God and allowing him to transfer me from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the dear son. And when I do... I now have access to something. Now, it's funny. We can actually transition from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the dear son, have God power at our disposal, if you want to say it that way, and still, ironically, function in self-effort. That ought not to be. Doesn't that sound like something Paul would say? That ought not to be. Why would we do that? Why, if we have been set free by God and enabled by a superior power to actually be able to accomplish that which we previously couldn't, would we return to self-effort? Would we return to the flesh? It would be irrational, wouldn't it? Because we have been given something, it's called grace in the New Testament. We have been given God's very presence to be able to enact, to be able to carry out this betterment. See, God has given us in our human makeup a desire to grow, a desire to escape from lower behaviors. And he says, how are you doing there with your lower behaviors? Well, I, uh, yeah, I sure got a lot of them here. He goes, do you want out? And then we're like, yes. And then we try in our own effort to get out. He's like, that's not working, is it? No. So I want you to trust me because the Christian life is supposed to function over here in the second position we actually are enabled to do something with our life that no human around us outside of the grace of God could accomplish. The fruit of the Spirit that is supposed to be evidenced in us, remember in Galatians 5, uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, most of us could look at that, and there's a lowercase version of each one of those. It's like love, okay. I could love you know, yeah, I love, I love pizza, yeah, I love sleep. Uh, yeah, but that's not the same sort of love. This is a higher form of love which is able to forsake self and consider someone else's benefit over our own. Whoa, humans can't do that. Humans are innately self-absorbed. So to be able to turn outward and to consider someone else's benefit above your own means something is transformed inside of you, something is enabling you. That's right. It's called the love of Jesus Christ that is poured out in your heart, that is now able to come through your life. It's a supernatural form of love. Joy, joy over on the self-effort side of the ledger is humanly derived and circumstantially gained. In other words, as long as your team wins, you're happy. You have a certain glow in your soul, but if things go wrong in your circumstances, your team loses, for instance, you're down in the dumps. I remember the, in Denver, you know, we're, we're pretty excited about, you know, our football around here, even though it hasn't been that exciting to follow. And uh, the, back in the day when it was more exciting to follow, the John Elway days, of course, you know, someone could say the Peyton Manning days, but for me, it was the John Elway days. Those were the days when I was young and very excited about football and very vulnerable to emotional devastation because it didn't turn out the way I thought it should. And the Broncos lost four Super Bowls and I was devastated, emotionally devastated. And I remember hearing a statistic that traffic accidents on Monday morning after a Bronco loss skyrocket. And I just thought that was interesting. I've always sort of remembered that, that we as humans are so vulnerable to elements and circumstances in our life that affect us so dramatically. As a believer, let's move from the first position to the second position. It doesn't matter what's happening around us. 
We are robustly joyful. There is no circumstance. I don't care what it is. You could throw me in prison, start to torture me, and I can still rejoice. That is a gift and an ability that only a believer possesses. It is something that we have access to, but that doesn't mean we're always taking a hold of it. So the fruit of the Spirit, long and short, they're supernatural versions of living. There's something that is elevated. It's something that cannot be derived from a first position life. It must be done through a transformed life, one given to Jesus, one that has turned their life over to Jesus and yielded and allowing God to work in them and through them. The sail, that which carries the sailboat. I know, a profound statement right there. But a sailboat. A sailboat, now I know that they have engines on the sailboats now, but let's go back to old school sailboats. You know, the ones that were totally dependent upon a sail catching wind to move it forward. And that is a great picture of us as believers. And I, I skipped a, a scripture here. John 15, five, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit for without me, you can do nothing. It's sort of the same concept here as the branch and vine where we're like a boat and we're called to traverse this grand ocean. Like, uh, how am I supposed to do that? Well, if you trust in the sail, it will catch a certain wind. And when it catches the wind and you learn how to hold the sail and move the sail, I'm not a, a sail, sailor, so I can't really talk about it in any you know, intelligent way. But it's able to catch that and it moves the boat. That picture is actually profound with understanding how we move. So you want to get out of the dock? You want to move forward here? You're tired of living in this you know, place? Well, you need to put up your sail and you need to catch the wind and you need to allow God to move you forward. So the boat has a dependency. It needs the wind. Now, if we capitalize that wind, W, capital W-I-N-D, then what you have is a foreshadow of exactly how we live as believers my clicker, I have to like click twice to get it to move forward once. I'm not sure what the deal is with that. Oh, and just in case you didn't understand what I meant, I have a, an illustration for you. Isn't that nice? So that sail, and this, I'm going to make a, a statement here. It's on my next slide that might take me two clicks to get to. But uh, there is something profound about this in my life. Even though I'm not a sailor, I don't really know a lot about sailing. Uh, I mean, I know enough to know that that material in that sail catches wind, you know, right? I mean, I know that. I've, I've held up a piece of cardboard in a gusting wind and seen what happened. So I understand the, the principle, right? However, spiritually for me, I remember when I was young and God moved in a beautiful and profound way in my life. And I was grateful but I sort of presumed that God just always moved at that level of intensity or that level of wind. And so after a while of moving forward with God, you sort of bring down your sail and you're like, you know what? I think I want to just coast a little. And then you put up your sail because you're realizing you shouldn't be coasting and the wind isn't there the same way. And I recognize that I presumed upon the wind, that I presumed that God always is just gusting instead of recognizing that when God is moving in my life, I need to catch it. I need to always have that sail up. I need to be ready to receive from God when he is moving in my life, as opposed to presuming it's like, oh yeah, he'll just do it anytime I want. He's sort of at my beck and call. Instead of recognizing I'm actually totally dependent upon him. And who am I to presume that, you know, even though his wind is blowing, that I don't need to catch it right now. So here's my, oh, this is my second quick click. There it was, two clicks later. The wind in the sails. When the wind is blowing, don't set down your sails. Never presume upon the wind, cherish it, catch it and use it as if it may never return. Now, I'm not gonna say it's not gonna return. I'm just saying don't ever presume upon the wind. Don't think that you're in control of the wind. God has given you grace. He has blessed you with understanding. He's awakening your soul. He's speaking to you right now. Keep that sail up. Ride that wind wherever it takes you. Well, I mean, it's taking me really fast. That's good. Let it take you where it takes you. Don't 
try and define it yourself. And don't try and limit it so that it's more in agreement with where you want to go in your life. It's very critical that we submit to that wind. Reaching that point of readiness. For most of us, it's a process of mounting misery that readies us to draw the line in the sand. I don't know if you've ever noticed this about us as humans, but we're rather slow to wake up. And so we can recognize that, yeah, that is, this isn't the best version of me. Yeah, this isn't the best decision I could be making. Yeah, that's probably not the best direction I could be going in. And then we keep going in it. And we sort of wait for a catastrophe before we say, enough! So what I'd like to hint at today is that we don't wait, need to wait for a catastrophe. We don't need to wait for the extremity of consequence to come about before we draw a line in the sand and say, today is the day, right now. And it doesn't mean because some serious thing has happened. It's just that you're walking in agreement with the wind. The wind is blowing and he says, put up your sail, catch it, I'll get you out of this area right now. So there's a, a statement in scripture and it, it, you'll see it multiple times and that is that it's almost like this cup that fills up and it's going to be used, here's an illustration, Genesis 15, 16, in the fourth generation they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. First of all, that shows the tremendous grace of God to wait for the Amorites and their sin to totally fill up, right? It gives them plenty of opportunity to repent. However, uh, it's also showing something that in the human dimension of things, there is a time when something is full. The time comes to that point. The, the cup fully fills. Here is another statement, Daniel 8, 23. In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, that's the concept of something filling up, a king shall arise having fierce features who understand sinister schemes. It's, the idea I'm, I'm talking about is that in our life, there is sort of a similar cup. And you get tired of something, you get disgusted with something, you get frustrated with something, and then it continues. And then it continues. It comes to that brim point where it starts to overflow. All right, that's enough. What I want you to begin to do is not wait for a cup to fill up. I want you to look at your life and allow the Spirit of God to look at your life and examine your life today to say, where is it that you need to draw a line in the sand and say, no more? And where you need to draw in your, a line in your sand and say, this now starts today. I'm on three clicks for this one. Four clicks. Five clicks? I don't, no, oh, now, now it starts moving forward, huh? Reaching that point of readiness. Readiness to halt the bad. Readiness to unleash the good. In each of our lives, I would like the Spirit of God to be able to dig down deeper than we would typically allow, which is sort of a sad statement in the first place, right? He should be able to access anything and everything in our life. So let's let him. And let's let him touch these areas where there's certain things, certain behaviors, whether it's thought patterns where you know you should be applying truth to that. Instead, you always listen to the voice of anxiety or you always listen to the voice of doubt, or you listen to the voice of insecurity, the voice that says you're nothing. So instead of exerting the soul with truth to say that is not the truth, here is the truth, you just subside into silence and allow the enemy to beat you up. When are you going to have enough? Are you going to wait for the cup to totally fill up when there's a disaster in your life and you have no choice but to cry out to God? Or why don't you take God at his word today? Draw a line in the sand and say, this stops today. And then there's those activities, those actions, those things that we know God wants us to do, whether it's to speak to someone in our life, say something kind to someone in our life, ask forgiveness from someone in our life, whether it's to begin to share the gospel with someone in our life or just be available to share the gospel with someone when we're walking down the street. Whatever it is, those dimensions in our life where we have these reasons and these excuses that we draw a line in the sand and say, today is the day. I am actually going to move forward here. Now, if you're going to move forward, you're going to stop something. We need to make sure we know how to do that too. So first off, I want to allow that space inside of each of us 
to just say, Spirit of God, show me. Where do I need to be touched today? And then when we know where those spots are, we need to know how to move forward, how to stop something cold and how to move forward strong. Elihu of Barakel. I like this character. Uh, it's, he's in a strange part of the Bible. You know, he's in the book of Job. So many of us struggle to study Elihu because he's buried inside of a very difficult book, right? Not the easiest book. Some people really uh, don't enjoy the book of Job. It's a fantastic book. It really is. Of course, it's the Bible, right? So uh, you, you, know, you could say, well, you have to say that, Eric. But it really is a powerful story. I mean, Job, Eob is how you'd say it. Uh, his, his name means hated and despised. And he lives in Utz, U-Z. You know, it's this little funny looking uh, location, Utz. And that means the place of wood. Hated, despised, and the place of wood. Okay, are you seeing Jesus in this? Yeah, it's an incredible picture of that. So in the midst of this story, you see Job hit with all sorts of trials and challenges. And then he has three friends that join the party. And they have all sorts of opinions on the matter. And they're assuming that Job must have sinned. Otherwise, he wouldn't have gone through this terrible difficulty. And so meanwhile, there's this other character named Elihu of Barakel that's sitting there in the room. You know, I, I've still, my mental picture of the storyline isn't very clear. But he's there listening to the whole thing. And he's mad. He's upset because he hears Job talking and self-justifying, saying, I did nothing to deserve this. And then he hears the three friends talking, and they're just like out to lunch. It's like, come on, guys. And, but he's a young guy. And so he doesn't know exactly what to do in the situation. And so there's a quote I have here. My inner man is like wine that has no vent. So finally, he's going to talk. And I love the quote here. Job 32, 6, and then verses 17 through 20. So Elihu, the son of Barakel the Buzite, answered and said, I am young in years and you are very old. Therefore, I was afraid and dared not declare my opinion to you. I also will answer my part. I too will declare my opinion for I am full of words. The spirit within me compels me. Indeed, my belly is like wine that has no vent. It is ready to burst like new wineskins. I will speak that I may find relief. I must open my lips and answer. I actually totally understand this situation. It seems like it was a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if it was in my, one of my Teddy Roosevelt messages or it was a sermon, but I was talking about the fact that I was in a pastoral staff meeting and it was with all these old venerable characters that had sort of lost their fire. And I was in there with my fire still intact. And I was listening to them babble about all this ridiculous stuff, diminishing the power of what God could do in this generation. And it was driving me crazy. And I perched up on my seat and I, gra I wrapped my arms this is in the middle of a formal staff meeting. And I wrapped my arms around my legs. and I'm just trying to figure out, it's like, Lord, help me not say something right now. Help me. I don't, I shouldn't say something. I shouldn't say something. Oh no, I must say something. And then it came out and it wasn't very well received, uh, but the point being, I understand this, but what you see this dynamic in here when it says the spirit within me compels, you're going to see the work of grace inside of us as believers. If there is something, and it's first of all needs to start in our life, because we could look at the politics and the social dynamics of our age and we could feel very much like this. But if we don't feel like this in regards to the compromise of our own soul and our thoughts, that's where it must begin. We're going to be useless out there to change the world unless we allow the Spirit of God to change us. And so we need that same bursting sense inside of us to say, no more. This stops now. We need to pull an Elihu of Barakel within our own life. I want you to look at your compromise or your lowness of living or your, uh, your mediocre decision making. I want you to look at that like it's the three friends of Job. And I want you to look at it as separate from you as something that is hindering you from moving forward to reveal Jesus. And then I want you to draw a line in the sand. The line in the sand. There seems to be a point when you can't allow a bad thing to remain any longer. There seems to be a point when you can't wait any longer to take a step forward to do a good thing. So there's bad things that you're going to draw the line in the sand and say, no more. 
you will not progress, not one inch more. And there's other things where you draw the line in your sand and say, this bad behavior stops, this behavior begins right now. This godly good behavior must begin in my life. The line in the sand. So here's a couple more quotes. I need to stop this behavior. I need to start this behavior. So whichever one it is, I want you to land. It's usually both. It's usually two sides of the same coin, ironically. The Valley of Elah, introducing the characters. So we have three characters are going to introduce you to. There's a lot more characters in this, but Saul the rejected king of Israel, he's the first. He's the old man, the flesh, the self-centered ruler. So he's over here. It's interesting because Saul is the first king of Israel. So he's a symbol of the first. And he is powerless to stop the enemy that's approaching him. He doesn't want the enemy in his land, but he has no power to eliminate him. So he's a symbol of the first. Then we have David, the rightful king of Israel, the second, the spirit, the shepherd king, Jesus. So David is going to be a symbol of the second. He's the second king of Israel, so he's a great picture already. But he's also going to be of that lineage, of that heritage of the one that wins, that is the victory, that is empowered by the spirit to do and to not just stare at Goliath for 40 days, but to actually eliminate Goliath. So the first is powerless, whereas the second man has the power to do. And now we have our third character, Goliath, the great champion from Gath. This guy's rather intimidating. You know, I, I've, I've said this before in the past. You know, you, you read your Bible and it will say that he's nine and a half feet tall. But that's if you measure him according to the small cubit. There's nothing in the Bible that says if he was measured by a small or long cubit. So he could be 12 and a half feet tall. So that's what we're going with. This is one massive obstruction. And it's very intimidating. Just like the things that stand in your life. The enemy always boasts a loud boast. The question is, are you approaching your current battle with Saul's mentality or with David's? Because Saul, who was head and shoulders above all Israel, it means he was the giant of Israel. He was a massive man. If there was one guy that should have been heading out to take on Goliath, it should have been Saul. That's pretty obvious. However, he was unable and ill-equipped. I don't care. In your best version of yourself, your strongest version of yourself, your most determined, most awakened version of yourself, you are still unable to take down Goliath. You need power from on high to be able to do the deeds that God has called you to do. And that starts in your inner man. If you're going to overcome thoughts, if you're going to overcome behaviors, if you're going to overcome words that are spoken, you're going to see a new pattern set you need something greater than Saul's determination. You need David. So Goliath is symbolic of the power of sin, vice, lies, darkness, Satan. So he's going to be boasting, Goliath is going to be boasting in the Valley of Elah for 40 days. 40 is always this number of proving. So like Moses is going to be ready to deliver the people of Israel and then God's going to lead him into the desert for 40 years. At the end of those years, Moses has been proven. Ironically, to himself, he recognizes, I can't do this. But to God, now God's like, you're ready. Why? Because you realize you can't do this. <laughs> what an interesting proving that is. 40 years in the wilderness for the Israelites. And now an entire generation that doubted, that was fearful, has been eliminated. And now it's the generation that is ready, that has faith to move in and take a land. And the same thing has to happen in us. That which is doubting and fearful has to be removed and we need to respond in faith to move forward. You want to move out of this position? You want to draw a line in the sand? You need the second. So the flesh doesn't have an answer for the problem of Goliath and that's what the 40 will always prove. So are you able to do this in your own strength? No. You see, there's a, a simple principle at work in the Christian life and that is the word I can't. Now, it sounds terrible because your parents always told you never say the word I can't, right? or the phrase I can't. And yet, it's not to finish there. I can't, keep with me, but he can. You see, when we say I can, what we are oftentimes doing is setting ourselves up for a Saul 
like life. Because, yeah, it looks very impressive to the world and it sounds very impressive to your soul, very motivating. I mean, all sorts of nice posters with things like I can on it or you can. However, you can't, outside of Christ, produce anything of supernatural substance and what you need is supernatural. The Olympics are designed to show what men in their native state outside of God can accomplish in this earth. And it is impressive, but it's not supernatural and it's still a stench in heaven. I'm not saying he's against the Olympics. I'm just saying he's not impressed with our best down here outside of him. It's filthy rags to him, our best production to say, look, we are gods. And he says, he wants to spit it out of his mouth. It is distasteful to him. The thing that he esteems is humility expressing itself in love and faith. This is actually what enters into the kingdom of heaven. And so when we are willing to acknowledge, I can't do it as soul. I need to humble myself and trust my savior. Then, and only then, am I able to have the power of God to move me forward, to do things I never could as Saul. And that's exactly what's happening in this story. So David's famous statement, is there not a cause? So right now you could look at your life, your thoughts, your behavior, your words spoken and say, is there not a cause? Does this not matter in this earth? Does God not care about this? Is God just looking at that and saying, oh, it doesn't matter? Or is the reason he convicts us because it does matter and he does want us to live a better life, a life that reveals him as opposed to one that just sort of flounders around in its mediocre stew of nonsense. What are we doing in this earth? We have one shot at this life. Let's live it with gusto for Jesus Christ. Is there not a cause? First Samuel 17, 48. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried, hasted, and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Now, if you've hung around Ellerslie, you've heard me bring up this quite a few times. It's just this Hebrew word for hasted or hurried. Hurried, I don't like that translation, but you know, that's why you heard me say hasted. Not that hasted is a word we use, sounds like basted. Uh, but mahar is the Hebrew word and it means to move headlong. So this is how David is going to respond. So I want you to put yourself in this situation. Saul is justifying why you know, he needs to you know, not move against Goliath and he's calculating it, positives, negatives. David shows up, he says, is there not a cause? And he sprints towards the difficulty. He recognizes that this does not belong in the land of Israel. Lying in the sand, this goes. So to move headlong with haste, sprinting, springing straight into danger. To move with liquid ferocity as a lion towards his prey. So... It's interesting because this, this is a very attractive name, maybe in Hebrew, but in uh, English, the maharahi, you know, isn't the nicest sounding thing. I mean, but however, you might want to consider naming a child this because it's taking mahar and turning it into a proper name. Isn't that cool? So this is actually the description of a man now. And so the impetuous is how it's oftentimes translated. But how about this? The man of action. It's the one who does, who sees what needs to be done and does it. Isn't that a great name? Whether or not it's going to fit into our English-speaking culture, I'm not sure. But this guy was actually one of David's mighty men. Isn't that great? Named that. Impetuous. So this is the original description of what that word means. Rushing with great force and violence. Now, there's another definition of impetuous, which is more on the negative side, but this is actually what it meant. Moving rapidly, furious, forcible, fierce, raging as an impetuous wind, an impetuous torrent. So here's what I want each of us to be willing to allow God to do in our life today. And that is to make us spiritually impetuous, where we are ready to act. We are ready to say no to that which needs to be resisted, and we're ready to say yes to that which needs to be encouraged. One moved by impetus. So impetus, so you'll notice in the word impetuous, it's something moved by impetus. Now, impetus is one of those classic words that I like. 
I like words though, so I'm not sure in the normal vernacular of our culture if anyone understands some of these words that I whip out. But it's a great word. It's the force of motion. It's the force with which any body is driven or impelled. So it's that which is pushing it forward. It's the impetus behind it. So if that object is going to move, it's because it has impetus behind it. Well, if this object known as the body of Christ individually and corporately is going to move, we need impetus. We need something that is going to push us forward. The force with which one body in motion strikes another. What is the secret of gaining impetus? Because technically, this is what it comes down to, guys. You could see something in your life that needs to stop. You could see something in your life that needs to begin. Okay, you're going to just form a New Year's resolution for this? How are you supposed to move this forward? You're going to talk to your Saul side and say, Saul, we need to get our act together. Or you're going to talk to the Spirit of God and say, Spirit of God, here's your vessel. My answer is yes. Do what you do best. So what is the secret of gaining impetus? Is it our gumption? By the way, I have a lot of natural gumption. And if you look at, and I I recognize that now as I'm cresting into some older years that are hard to now say out loud, uh, that my human gumption has lessened. If you look at my tank, it's like, whoa, I'm sort of low on the human gumption side. What's going on? You tap the, you know, the, the thing to see if it's wrong. It's like, hey, I've always been full on human gumption. But human gumption is not what I can rely on anyways. And it's actually not bad as you get older that some of the human drive that we have as young guys to say, to take on the world, to change the world actually goes down because what does that do? It either leads to retirement or it leads to a life wholly dependent upon Jesus Christ. God, I can't do this outside of you, and now I know that, okay? I, I recognize I was sort of doing the half and half thing where I lean on you for half of it, and then I take the rest over. Because we have a lot of energy and a lot of strength when we're young. As we get older, whew, the tank starts to go lower. It's like, oh, wow, I just want to sleep in today. Well, retirement, huh? what, what age does that happen at? No! We have a job to do on this earth and it's not based on our human gumption. It's not based on our energy levels. It's based on heaven. So is it our personal strength? Well, as you get, as you're young, you like the thought of it being in your personal strength. It's like, yeah, we could change the world. All we have to do is decide to. Instead of recognizing that, I don't care if you're young or old, the same solution is present. You can't, only he can. The impetus, so here's, I'm giving it all away, guys. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been given to us so that we can do, so that we can act. It is not you just deciding today, going, and gritting your teeth. I don't mind you gritting your teeth. It's gritting your teeth and saying, Lord, you do it. Lord, I need wind. My sail is up. I'm ready. Take me forward. You need power to be able to do this. So I'm going to just go through a series of scriptures that are just good to nail this one in. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. How are you going to get this accomplished? First, the fact that you have the desire to move forward, where's that come from? That's God. Now you need to recognize the do. The will is there from God. Now the do is there from God. You need to allow him to will it and to do it in and through you. Second Chronicles 30, 12. Fascinating statement, guys. The hand of God was on Judah to give them singleness of heart to obey. Wouldn't you like to have the hand of God upon your life so that you have singleness of heart to obey? As opposed to, a divided heart where you're like half in for your life and your comforts and then you're sort of sort of half in for what God wants to do in your life but you're concerned about how that's going to affect your comforts and but to have singleness of heart to obey boy that's what the hand of the lord will do for us Isaiah 26:12 Lord you will establish peace for us for you have also done all our works in us that just a Interesting phraseology out of the Old Testament. He has done the works in us. 
He's the one that's preparing us, even for a sermon like this, to hear it and to say, yes, Lord, line in the sand, to actually rally our inner man around the truth and to yield to God, to put up our sails. 2 Corinthians 3, 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. Hebrews 13, 21. So this is in the context talking about the God of peace. May the God of peace make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Who's the one that is going to do this work? It is the God of peace who works in us to accomplish it. 2 Timothy 1.9, the Lord has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Ephesians 6.1, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 1 Thessalonians 5.24, faithful is he who has called you, who also will do it. You have received a calling. How do you plan on carrying it out? You have two options. Self-effort, God power. Saul, David. Flesh, spirit. Adam, Jesus. You either handle it with clay or you handle it with the strength of heaven. The Christian life is learning how to coordinate this movement between heaven and earth to allow heaven to work in our bodies, through our bodies, to actually showcase heaven on this earth in and through us. This is a mystery. That's why it's called that. It is a mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed Christ in us, the hope of glory. This is the grand truth that we have the privilege of revealing, but our propensity, even as gospel-believing believers, is to still default back to Adam, to Saul, to flesh, to human effort, as opposed to learning to coordinate a dependent relationship, a vine-branch relationship where you adhere to that, that vine and you allow that sap to come into your branch to produce the fruit as opposed to you attempting to muscle it out of yourself. This is not dependent on your muscle. And for those of us that are getting older, we can thank God for that. That's a little easier to thank God for as you get older. It's dependent upon his muscle. It's not dependent on our works. It's dependent upon his work and his working. This is Christianity. It always has been Christianity. So let's walk in stride with that reality today. Must we wait for the extremity? Must you wait for your life's cup to fill up to the brim and to overflow with human difficulties that God didn't assign but are just the results of your disobedience, of your recalcitrant behavior, of your ignorance of his truth? Must we wait for the extremity before we make a change, before we draw a line in the sand? Can we draw the line in the sand today? All right, I have a scripture for this, guys, and this is how I'm going to finish. Today is the day, and our God is faithful to do it. So one of the things about Christianity that I love is that his mercies are new every morning, right? You guys know that. That's, that's the scripture that is always very nice to have in your hip pocket, especially when the night before you feel like you were dumb to wake up the next morning to recognize that his mercies are new. But today is the day. So right now, this is where salvation is, right today. Which means this is where his saving power is. This is when the wind is. It's not tomorrow, it's today. This is when the enabling grace is. It's always in the present moment. And so if I'm talking to an unbeliever, I'm going to appeal on that exact line. And I'm going to say, this isn't something for tomorrow, this is something for today. This is when God is present convicting you. This is when you respond. This is when you draw the line in the sand and say, no more of the kingdom of darkness. I enter into the kingdom of light by faith. This is when you decide as a believer 
to no longer live in mediocrity, but to rise up and allow the power of God to move you forward into excellence. In every aspect, every attribute of your life, God is refining and sanctifying us so that we would reveal his person. Our job is to agree with that process. Yes, Lord. To humble ourselves and say, God, apart from you, I can't do this. And I thank you for that reality. Because your product, what you want to do in and through my life is so superior to anything I could do in my flesh. So Lord, here I am. Whether it's your marriage, whether it's your family relationships, whether it's how you handle your finances, whether it's how you handle your thought life, whether it's how you handle your sexuality, whether it's how you handle anything else in your life. I don't know what it is and I'm not the one that probably is supposed to pinpoint it. That's the Spirit's work in your life. However, there are things you know should not continue and there are things you know should progress. And I want you to deliberately choose in your life that today is the day. So here's our scripture, guys. Paul speaking in 2 Corinthians 6. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I want you to to think about what's in quotes. In other words, Paul is saying that God has said that in an acceptable time, I have heard you. Wouldn't that cause all of you to say, oh boy, when's the acceptable time then that he's going to hear me? And then, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Well, God, could we bring about another day of salvation because I really need help right now? So what does Paul say? Just in case you're wondering that, when is going to be the acceptable time? When is the day of salvation? So Paul removes all the fog bank on this. So I'm going to isolate out this statement because this is what you need today. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. It's in the now. Right now is when God's grace is ready to intersect your life and to enable you forward out of a ditch and onto the clear highway. For those of you that are tired of old behaviors lingering, I want you to freshly submit that to God. Not just say, well, I've tried that. Remember that bike that I bought for New Year's resolution? There are two ways. It seems like I've said this about 10 times in this message. There's two ways to address your line in the sand moments. Your own gumption, your own human effort, your best that you could give and bring to the table. Or the best that your God can bring to the table which is the Holy Spirit. You choose today how you want to live your life. A Christian has access to all the supply of heaven to move forward and out of their challenge points. It does not mean that our challenge points don't have benefit for us. Oh, they do. They teach us dependency. They teach us to call out on our God. And there's nothing quite like a ditch season in our life where we know we're supposed to be on that road, but our wheels are spinning off in the side. Because then when you're back on that road, guess what? You really cherish that road. And you recognize how important it is to stay on a straight and narrow path. And so God will even leverage our ditches in our life to his advantage. Even what the enemy means for evil, God will turn for good in our life. This is God's way. This is his manner. And we can cherish it today that even if you find yourself with spinning wheels in a ditch, guess what? You have a God who has a really good tow truck right now who is ready. If you're ready to draw a line in the sand to say, let's get you back up on the road. Let's get you moving. By the way, I don't know if you've heard this before, but my mercies are new for you right now. I love you. I care about you. I have a beautiful future for you starting right now. You ready? Take my hand. Father, we want to take your hand. And we want you to lead us into the way of salvation. Salvation, maybe not from eternal hell fire for many of us, but salvation from our mediocrity. Salvation from our excuses. Salvation from our rationalizations and justifications. Salvation from lowness of living, lowness of thinking, lowness of believing. Lord, are you not worthy and deserving of our best? Everything we are, to own every inch, 
Every centimeter of our soul, our minds, our hearts, our emotions, our dreams and ambitions. Lord, here you go. Here it is. We want to humble ourselves afresh before you and say, we can't do this apart from you. We don't want to take these compromises lightly. We want to take them seriously. Lord Jesus, take us upward. We don't want to go downward. So Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to breathe upon us afresh, to empower us, to enable us today, to give us a smile in our soul and a vision for the future because we know that our God is the wind in our sails. We ask for this in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ. Amen.